Hello again. Um, I'm hopeful that you've been able to watch the last few lectures because if you have, um, this, this lecture that I've got for you right now is going to make an awful lot of sense. We have really been talking about this growing, budding civil rights movement and we've talked about a little bit of progress that that civil rights movement has made. Um, what you're going to see here today are people that are going to be a little bit, um, shall we say, impatient with how, how fast that uh, progress is uh, spelling itself out. Um, the other thing that we've talked a bit about would be the development known as the Vietnam War. And if you watch that last video lecture that, uh, you know, that, that we've had here, uh, you'll see that things get pretty messy, pretty confusing in Vietnam, and it's pretty quickly in the going. Keep in mind, guys, when, when LBJ went into Vietnam in 1964, a big part of that gamble, a big reason that he felt relatively comfortable going in was the fact that over 70% of Americans agreed with some sort of intervention. They weren't entirely sure what, but um, something ought to happen. What the Tet Offensive did was it changed all of that. Now keep in mind, guys, what the Tet Offensive was was a massive assault all across South Vietnam, not in the jungle where uh, we were weakest, but uh, in the cities like Saigon where we were strongest. And, and no, it, it wasn't the brink of disaster. I think Walter Cronkite, America's newsman, acknowledged that. But what it does demonstrate is that the government is lying. For your notes, guys, what the Tet Offensive is going to do is it's going to give rise to something that historians call the credibility gap. The idea that the government is either lying uh, or it's not, it's not telling the entirety of the truth to the American people. Keep in mind that what the Johnson administration had done was gone on a PR campaign proclaiming the war to be going just fine and victory would be very near at hand. And what Ted does is it demonstrates we're clearly not winning. It's also going to give a major shot in the arm to the anti-war movement. Okay, um, This anti-war movement is really going to begin, I don't want to say slow, but it's going to be small. Okay, Keep in mind, we had been at work in Vietnam since at the very least the mid-1950s. By the early 1960s, people, especially on college campuses, had begun to take notice. And when they began to um, squawk about uh, what the American government was doing and how this was a bad idea, Lyndon Johnson was able to uh, dismiss them as nervous Nellies or dupes that had been taken in by their overeducated college professors, things of that variety. But the other thing that's really going to get Lyndon Johnson in trouble, and, and this is going to play a very, very direct role in this um, growing anti-war movement, would be the implementation of the draft. The tours in Vietnam were 12 months long, which means that um, you, you, you served 365 days and then your, then your service in Vietnam was done. That's great in the sense that it was going to be short. Uh, Civil War enlistments were three years, just, uh, just for a little bit of perspective. What it also means is that Lyndon Johnson's going to need to draft a lot of people. Okay, he's not going to be able to get away with drafting nameless, faceless kids whose parents didn't vote and didn't sit on PTA boards and you know didn't watch the news. He's he's going to have to draft middle Americans whose parents are best described as middle class Americans, and they can bite back, uh, especially with their with their ballots, with their voting ballots. The 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 anti-war movement is is ultimately going to give rise to a class consciousness as well. There were people that um, were in, in the process of trying to get out of service, uh, draft dodgers as they came to be known. Um, if you were physically unable to serve, that, um, that, that got you out of service. Um, now, physically unable could mean anything that your feet were so big uh, or you had flat feet and they didn't have boots that would fit you. That got you off the, uh, the hook. So, too, did things that were not necessarily really, really pressing physical ailments, uh, but certainly things that uh, maybe would raise an eyebrow or two, something like uh, bone spurs or something along those lines. In any case... Um, these are ways that uh, you could get out of service in Vietnam. 
Another very important way that's going to become very, very political quickly is college. Initially, this goes away eventually, but initially, if you were in college at the time, um, you were exempt, at least for that period. And so this is really going to assume the rich man's war, poor man's fight sort of mentality, and it's going to do so pretty quickly here, okay? We'll come back to this here in just a second. But the group that is really leading the charge when it comes to the anti-war movement, that would be Students for a Democratic Society. We've talked about these guys. They're, our, they're a member of the New Left uh, growing out of the early 1960s that really began to challenge that Cold War consensus very, very directly. They begin to protest Lyndon Johnson's escalation of the war. They begin to conduct what they were, co were calling teach-ins to protest an ROTC presence on university and college campuses, proclaiming that uh, institutions of higher learning were supposed to help mankind and broaden the scope of humanity, not find various ways to destroy it. But it's really from these universities that the anti-war movement is going to morph into this gigantic social movement that it would eventually become. In uh, 1965, there were very few people that could find Vietnam on a map. A couple of years later, by 1967, uh, the anti-war movement was able to mobilize approximately 80,000 people, sometimes on a weekly basis, that would protest on the National Mall in Washington, um, especially Stop the Draft Week, in which young men began to burn their draft cards in protest. Uh, I'm not fighting in your, in your war. Uh, it's immoral for a lot of different purposes. And so you're beginning to see this really vitriolic pushback against the Johnson administration. Um, all of this is going to lead us into 1968. If you followed along with me, in that last lecture, by 1968, Lyndon Johnson realizes that this jig is up, okay? Um, his numbers are just not there, and a big reason for this is, is, is lying about how well the war was going. I can't emphasize enough how much toll the Tet Offensive took on American politics. If you recall, I told you at the time that Johnson more or less steps down in 1968, and it's the anti-war movement that really brings so much pressure, so much bad publicity onto him. It's really forcing this issue with Lyndon Johnson. And so what that means is you're going to have to find a new candidate for president in 1968. And as you're going to find out, this is basically going to come down to a three-horse race. One of them that a lot of people see as having the inside track is the gentleman that you're looking at at the bottom of that PowerPoint slide right there. That's uh, Lyndon Johnson's current vice president, and that'd be Hubert Humphrey. Um, Hubert Humphrey is going to be the stay the course candidate. If you elect me, I will fight Vietnam to a conclusive end, whatever that happens to me. The anti-war movement, uh, excuse me, the anti-war candidate, that would be a guy from Minnesota, a guy by the name of Eugene McCarthy, not to be confused with Joe McCarthy. Eugene McCarthy was a liberal Democratic uh, um, senator from the state of Massachusetts. He was not radical, I really want to make that clear, but he did believe that we were probably doing more harm than good in Vietnam and proclaimed that he would get us out if he were elected. The third horse that is worth noting is um, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, who at the time is the uh, senator from Massachusetts. He'll declare his candidacy a little bit later in the process, but in any case, he is, uh, he is a candidate. Um, he's also the brother of the fallen former president, John F. Kennedy. Now, the Democratic National Convention was held in Chicago in 1968. And on the eve of the convention nominating ceremony, we still don't know who's going to be the nominee. And the delegates are very split on this, even going into the nominating night. And in the end, Hubert Humphrey is going to get this nomination. The Hawk candidate, the war candidate, is going to get this nomination. And the anti-war delegation inside the, the Chicago Stadium is going to storm out into the streets. And what they're going to see is described as a police riot.
The anti-war movement had sent people, um, people had been planning to protest at the Democratic National uh, Convention's site in Chicago for, for weeks and weeks. It was a massive, massive protest that spilled out. Now, the guy running Chicago is, is one of the instrumental forces that got John F. Kennedy elected, uh, Richard Daly. And Richard Daly absolutely wanted no part of this bad publicity, so he really began to beef up the police presence in Chicago to make sure nothing got out of hand. You can kind of see where this one's headed. When the protesters insisted on staying and protesting the nomination of Humphrey, the police tried to disperse them. And when many of them refused to go, um, it got relatively violent. Um, the problem, especially for the Democratic Party, is this whole thing is being captured on, on, on camera. Both newspaper uh, uh, journalists as well as TV news camera crews are beaming this into American living rooms. And as this is happening, the protesters are shouting, the whole world's watching, the whole world's watching. And in fact, the whole world was watching, and what they saw was a party, the Democratic Party, that was coming apart at the seams. What the siege of Chicago is going to basically do is really two things. Number one, it's going to make the Democratic Party look like it's a mess, and it is. The other thing that it's going to do is it's really going to up the likelihood that you will see a Republican president in the White House in 1968, and that's ultimately going to come to pass uh, with the election of Richard Nixon. But for right now, I want to talk about more of this radicalization, and I want to have it bleed into the civil rights movement. If you've seen that video lecture, The Other America, you'll know that not everybody came along for this post-war um, economic joyride. There were groups that were left out. And one of those groups were city dwellers in places like Los Angeles. And who's living in places like Los Angeles, racial, ethnic minorities, uh, for some of the same reasons that they had always lived in the cities. Partly, that's where the jobs used to be. And uh, typically, when people relocated, that's, that's where they relocated to, the cities. In Los Angeles, in the 1960s, um, there was rampant levels of unemployment for African-American youths. Um, massive amounts of unemployment in a, in a time period that really suggested that there should not be. In other words, this wealth was not as widely distributed as we might like to have believed it was. What was worse is the police presence in Los Angeles. The Los Angeles police had a long, infamous history of institutionalized racism um, and it was nothing whatsoever out of the ordinary for them to comb the streets of South Central Los Angeles, the heart of the black community, and pick up, for pe pick up people, pick up African-American young men for uh, the crime of loitering, throw them in jail, and, and, and just let days pass by without charging them. That's the most basic level of infringement upon civil rights. And everybody knew that this kind of thing was happening. Well, ultimately, it boils over in the summer of 1965 in what was known at the time of the Watts Ghetto, right, the heart of the African-American community. There is a black motorist that is going to be arrested, and to make a long story short, the cops were pretty rough with him, and they're doing this more or less in front of the entire black community. What the result is going to be is, is, is a, a groups of angry uh, community members, angry African Americans, that are going to begin rioting. And when I say that, what I mean is not just uh, you know pushing back against the police, although certainly you could make that case. I'm talking about burning down buildings. I'm talking about destroying property. I'm talking about a riot in the very you know truest sense of the riot. And I'm hopeful that you're paying very close attention and you're you're, you're listening carefully because you're not hearing me say race riot. We've talked about riots in this class before. As a matter of fact, we talked about Los Angeles and a riot in this class not so long ago. The Zoot Suit riots, which absolutely had a racial component to them. The Watts riot does not. 
This is a, I hesitate to use the term demonstration, but there are a lot of people that call what happened in Watts in 65, the Watts Rebellion. It was a rebellion against uh, an economic system that did not work for everybody, and they could demonstrate as much. It was a rebellion against a racist uh, police force uh, that was not policing the neighborhood, but more or less uh, persecuting it, or at least what those, those people, that's how they felt, okay? More than anything, what, what, what the real rub is, is Vietnam, and, and this is how Vietnam connects to all of this. The more money you had, the, the more access you had to information and ways to get yourself out of service. Um, I, I kind of insinuated this earlier on in the lecture, but if, if your father knew a doctor, or if your father or himself was a doctor, he or she or he would be able to tell you this is what you need to do to fail the physical examination. And so the less money you had or the less access to this information that you had, the more likely it was that you were going to be drafted and sent over to Vietnam and not be able to get out of it. Again, rich man's war, poor man's fight. The rub is, here we are in Los Angeles with all these glaring problems, and we're asking these young black men who are being drafted and sent over to go over and fight for freedom and democracy in Southeast Asia that were the light of the world. And truth be told, we don't have freedom nor democracy in Los Angeles. Um, tragically, this is not the last time that we're going to talk about these um, urban rebellions as they come to be known. Um, you're going to see this in Newark, very similar, um, you know, a, a perceived police harassment. Uh, 1967, you, later on that year, you'll also see it in Detroit, uh, as a matter of fact, it got so bad in Detroit that the National Guard was called in. Uh, that's what you're looking at there at the bottom of that uh, screen, if you're following along there with me. Um, there, there are economic problems very similar to, uh, to Los Angeles. Uh, there are police problems, racial problems, very similar to what I talked about with Watts. And so these urban rebellions... You know, a lot of people, myself included, see them as the radicalization of the civil rights movement. This was not what Martin Luther King, what Ralph Abernathy had been preaching. The problem is, as, as people in places like Detroit and Los Angeles saw it, um, that approach to civil rights organizing was moving painfully, painfully too slow. Um, a lot of people are beginning to move in a different direction. And upon the end of the riots, when they were interviewed, some of the people that had, uh, shall we say, participated uh, said, listen, our, our schools were terrible. Our, our unemployment was off the charts. Um, we're going to go a different direction when it comes to people asking us to turn the other cheek. And so that's what I mean when I say this radicalization of the civil rights movement through these urban rebellions. You're not only going to see this in the black community, you're going to see this in the um, Chicano community as well. Now, the term Chicano comes out of the late 1960s when a group of Mexican-American students kind of coined the term um, in 1969. But the term Chicano is a very politically charged term. It means a person of uh, uh, Mexican ancestry living in the United States, but very very keenly aware of the institutionalized inequality that has sort of landed that community in its in its current state okay um, the fact that there was land that was stolen out from underneath these people that were land owners in the southwestern part of North America uh, through the US Mexican War the fact that uh, there were all kinds of shady business practices when the railroad companies were coming through, when the, you know, when the mining companies were coming through. And so what this Chicano movement is, is seeking to do is not that much different than what people like Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael are calling for uh, more uh, leadership within the Mexican-American community. Uh, if you're following along on the PowerPoint with me, the guy on the uh, bottom left corner of the screen with the microphone in front of him, that is a guy named Rudolfo Corky Gonzalez, who had led this uh, uh, campaign known as the Crusade for Justice. 
And what he called for was Chicano-owned businesses in Chicano-owned neighborhoods, uh, Chicano teachers in, in school districts that uh, uh, Chicanos made up the bulk of the population. Um, this crusade for justice was very relevant to this Chicano movement, as were the Brown Berets. If you're looking at the PowerPoint, they're at the, the top of that screen there. Um, the Brown Berets were almost like a, uh, a, a, a Mexican-American Chicano counterpart to the Black Panthers. It was a manifestation of the radicalization of this element of the civil rights movement. Now keep in mind, guys, we've talked about uh, issues that involve civil rights in a southwestern context. We've talked about LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens. We've talked about the American GI Forum. Uh, we've talked about um, uh, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Yorta, and the UFW. And we've been building, building, building toward a much more radical, much more militant, and much more proactive approach uh, to, to demanding civil rights, and certainly that's going to be the case for the Chicano movement. Back East, Martin Luther King is very concerned about what's going on by 68. And the reason that he's concerned is he understands that if you, if you allow the movement to resort to violence, and that, that's when everything is going to end. That's when you don't come back. Because when you act violently, you give the system an excuse to come back after you. And this is the reason why MLK felt that he had to find a way to demonstrate that nonviolence could work. Lucky for him, there was a woman within the Southern, Le Southern Christian Leadership Conference by the name of Marion Wright, who had this idea of rounding up all poor people of all colors, all races, all ethnicities, all directions of the country, um, all walks of life, marching them to Washington and demonstrating in front of the eyes of the federal government that this level of poverty exists, that it's not a black problem or a brown problem or a white problem or a polka dot problem, it's an American problem. And that's ultimately what Martin Luther King is going to dedicate the next few months of his life to, in what comes to be known as the Poor People's March to Washington. Now, for your notes, I want to make sure that this is very clear. As Marion Wright outlined, this is an interracial effort to march to Washington. It combined African Americans from the rural South with Chicanos from the Southwest, uh, poor, uh, impoverished whites from Appalachia. African-American urban dwellers that were uh, trapped in poverty in these cities, all of these groups are making their way to Washington, D.C. to demonstrate to the American government that this level of grinding poverty exists in the richest country in the history of mankind. In the middle of all of this, it's going to be interrupted by a labor management dispute in Memphis, Tennessee. In April 1968, the sanitation workers of Memphis had gone out on strike. And when I say sanitation workers, really what I'm being is it's a polite way of saying garbage men. They were almost exclusively black. They were overworked. They were underpaid. They were forgotten. They were almost like the poster children of this poor people's march that Martin Luther King was trying to bring before everyone's attention. And when they called their strike, they asked Martin Luther King if he might help lead a demonstration in the hopes that the city government would, would see um, where they were coming from and grant them the right to form a union. That's what they wanted. They wanted the ability to form a union and bargain collectively with the city government. Because just a day before the strike was called, a man was crushed to death in his garbage truck for faulty equipment that they had told the city government needed to be fixed, otherwise it was not going to have a very happy ending. Long story short, Martin Luther King very, very, you know, eagerly agreed. He comes to, uh, comes to Memphis. He's all set. He's all ready to lead this march downtown. Uh, you have to understand that the city fathers of Memphis desperately did not want this to happen, primarily because they had their eye on Watts. They had their eye on Detroit. They knew that this guy, Martin Luther King, was very polarizing. We've got a very romanticized understanding of what MLK was, but he was a deeply, deeply controversial figure 
for many, many people. I don't mean this that he was a bad person. I just mean to some people he was a very controversial individual. In any case, the city government issued an injunction that prevented King from, from marching. Now, King, this wasn't his first rodeo, if you understand what I mean. But the people that were marching with him were so furious that the city government had the audacity to do something like this that they began to get violent. And the violence continued to erupt, and it got so bad that King had to call off the march. As a matter of fact, he had to get scooped up and flown back to Atlanta, where he went back to work on this Poor People's March. But any time Memphis came on the news... Anytime somebody brought that up, he got very quiet, very dejected. You could tell that this weighed heavily on his mind. Later on in April, he's going to make a return visit there. He's going to bring his legal uh, wing of SCLC along with him. And they managed to get this, um, get this injunction thrown out. And inside the Lorraine Hotel, um, there's, there's sort of like this pillow fight that's breaking out. You know, I, I don't really have a great way to describe it other 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 than like when somebody scores a touchdown you see these massive men out there pile on to each other they're acting like children that sort of thing and MLK um, that evening could not decide if he was going to wear a jacket not wear a jacket and he was walking on the balcony to get his jacket Ralph Abernathy said you've been a little bit under the weather you probably need your jacket and that's when a shot ran out and uh, according to Abernathy, all he could see was his feet. Um, someone outside of the hotel had assassinated Martin Luther King. And that night, the cities erupted in violence. You have to understand that it was King that, that was really the voice of reason in all of this. In an era where even the civil rights movement was inching closer and closer to, you know, just throwing down the gauntlet and resorting to raw, unapologetic violence, King was the guy that really kept the wheels on the car, and now he's gone. And when he died, a lot of the, the momentum of the movement was just simply evaporating. Ralph Abernathy continued the good fight and led his people to Washington, D.C., where the Poor People's March erected what would come to be known as Resurrection City. But by that point in time, after, after King had died, um, not only the momentum was gone, but the attention was gone as well. There was one very, very important exception. And that was the senator that I had mentioned earlier on in this lecture, Robert F. Kennedy from Massachusetts. Kennedy was deeply disturbed by what the Poor People's March demonstrated. And in the aftermath of Resurrection City, he's going to tour the South. He's going to tour uh, impoverished regions of the Southwest, the ghettos, and, and take stock of people that went to bed hungry, children that went to bed hungry, not have enough food at night. And in 1968, he's going to declare his presidential candidacy on an anti-war, anti-poverty, pro-civil rights platform. And it's, it's, like I said, really a three-horse race. And the thought was whoever wins in California, which is toward the end of the primary process, whoever wins California, huge primary in and of itself, is going to be the winner. It's Kennedy that's going to win the California primary. And he's seen as almost a lock to win the Democratic candidacy. Unfortunately, the night that he won the California um, primary, he was assassinated by a guy by the name of Sirhan Sirhan. There's a lot that we simply don't know about Sirhan Sirhan, uh, much like the JFK uh, assassination. There's a lot of conspiracy theories. Um, as I said back then, I don't get into conspiracy theories. But what I need you to understand about Kennedy's death, Robert F. Kennedy, that is, is two people in the same year, months, months apart from each other. They, they're gone. The civil rights movement is being decapitated. It's, it's not just one leader. It's, it's, it's Malcolm X, and then it's Martin Luther King, and then it's Robert F. Kennedy. I mean, person after person after person is being taken away from the movement.
And this, this is going to throw everything into disarray. It's going to throw politics into disarray. I had hinted around at this earlier in the lecture. Richard Nixon is going to win the 1968 presidential race. He's not going to win it by a landslide. He'll win. And he's going to inherit an, an absolute disaster of a situation. i got to have you understand something. It's not just Vietnam that's blowing up, no pun intended, although it is. Um, it's, it's not just the radicalization of the civil rights movement, although it is. It, it's, it's not just this massive amount of social unrest. It's also a, a really a polarization, polarizing period in American history. When we get to the 21st century, a lot of the issues that we have when it comes to deep social divisions within American life, um, you'll see that, that in many, many ways they're going to get their origins in the mid to late 1960s. You'll see what I mean when we get to that point in the semester. For right now, on that very sobering note, that's where we're going to end it.